The rebirth of the Minutemen took place at a critical juncture in history. After the fall of the Institute, the region was ready to begin growing again. But without an adequate military it would fall prey to super mutants, mercenaries, and raider bands. In this episode of the Commonwealth series we will look at how the Minutemen reorganized themselves into an effective fighting force that would protect the young nation in its first crucial years. During the constitutional meetings that formed the Commonwealth, the existential threat posed by the Gunners was also discussed. All agreed that for the Commonwealth to grow as a nation that the Gunners would have to leave or be forcibly ejected. But no one could agree as to how to achieve this. John Hancock sensed the conflict that would soon erupt in the Commonwealth. He began preparing for it by providing Preston Garvey with the funds to begin recruiting and rearming the Minuteman forces. Finally in late February, Congress sent a draft resolution to the Gunners. They had till the 1st of September of 2288 to leave the Commonwealth or be forced out. The Gunners ignored the resolution and carried on as normal. The Minutemen had six months to prepare. The sole survivor saw the need to train and reform the Minutemen to be effective guardians of the Commonwealth. He also knew that he would not be around to do it. He had already planned to leave for Far Harbor in the early spring. He therefore sought out someone that could help the Minutemen. Paladin Dons had been living in seclusion since Institute Files had proven that he was a synth. The sole survivor persuaded him that rather than to live a meaningless life in a bunker, that he could do some good for the world by training the Minutemen to protect the Commonwealth. Preston Garvey was reluctant to accept Darnes's help. However, he did not have much hope of retraining the Minutemen by himself. And so, Paladin Dons became Minuteman Lieutenant John Answer. Dons made a secret visit to the Cambridge Police Station and managed to convince Knight Reese to follow him into exile. Together they set about instilling tough discipline into the Minutemen. Drills on marksmanship, small unit tactics, teamwork, and above all else, discipline. Sergeant Reese was an especially feared drill instructor that would tolerate no excuses. You will drill till you either learn or until you die. Dancer would teach the officers tactics and leadership skills at night. In his spare moments he composed a military manual to train new recruits long after he was gone. Little by little the individualistic Minutemen began thinking and acting as a professional military. Without professional equipment however, they stood little chance against the gunners. Weapons were one of the first issues to be addressed. The original Minutemen relied on their personal firearms and lasers. This was a mixed lot, ranging from homemade pipe weapons, to family relics passed down since the Great War, to well-maintained hunting rifles. No consistency existed. Dancer explained that in order for commanders to predict battlefield performance that the soldiers needed to carry known and reliable weapons. Captain Dancer hated the laser musket from the start. I have never seen such a misbegotten collection of scrap in all my life. Dancer wanted to throw away all the laser muskets and replace them with conventional firearms and lasers. He was overruled by most of the senior commanders who had a fondness for the weapon. He was however able to severely restrict the numbers of laser muskets in the ranks. He also persuaded the Minutemen to use the laser musket as a sniper rifle rather than a close quarter weapon. Ironically, Dancer would die carrying a laser musket. He had been gifted the musket by Colonel Garvey just the day before. Had he carried his usual combat rifle, he might have survived the battle at Acadia. With limited options available to them, the Minutemen would have to rely on two pre-war relics as their main infantry weapons, the combat rifle and the assault rifle. During the resource wars, the Department of Defense divided military commands by priority. Frontline areas such as Alaska and China receive top-of-the-line equipment in massive quantities. Secondary theaters such as Canada and Mexico receive less equipment. Military backwaters such as the New England Commonwealth received the least equipment and would often receive rejected items. Every year, the DoD gave out lucrative weapons contracts to manufacturers. Not every weapon was accepted into frontline service however. The DoD considered the New England Commonwealth to be one of the areas of least concern. 
Therefore, along with other weapons, the Commonwealth received two somewhat dubious weapons designs. The Independent Arms Group created a modular assault rifle in the early 21st century. The idea was that the weapon could be easily converted from an assault rifle to a squad support weapon with just a few field modifications. A liquid coolant jacket on the barrel would allow for continuous fire over extended periods of time without the need to let the weapon cool. A complicated series of pipes would move the liquid coolant away from the barrel. The sights, suppressor, and the stock could all be swapped out to theoretically make the weapon into a sniper rifle. The US Army evaluated the weapon and found it deficient in several areas. The primary problem was the weight. At 9 pounds or nearly 5 kilos, the basic weapon was heavier than other assault rifles. When fully kitted out, it tipped the scales at 28 pounds or nearly 13 kilos. The weight of the weapon, spare ammunition, and spare parts would fatigue soldiers on long missions. If damaged, the cooling pipes could rupture and spray hot coolant onto the soldier. The weapon had a cumbersome reload process and the flash and sound suppressor for the sniper configuration tended to reduce accuracy at long ranges. The standard magazine carried no more rounds than other assault rifles and the extended drum magazine carried less ammunition than the light machine gun already in use. When power armor became available the weapon found some small success in the hands of power armor infantry. Most of the assault rifle stocks ended up in storage depots across the Commonwealth. Circle G, the maker of the combat rifle, was mostly known as an ammunitions maker. They made their name in the 20th century by producing a variety of bullet calibers. Wanting to prop up their sales of 45 caliber ammunition, they decided to begin producing weapons. A report from the US military noted that the bulk of infantry combat took place in urban settings and at short ranges. Circle G concluded that it was therefore not necessary to use high caliber rounds for long range combat. Using this as justification, they introduced the 45 caliber combat rifle. Even the designer of the rifle, Hugo K. Stoner, knew that this was a bad idea and would later demand that his name not be associated with the rifle. Company executives persisted anyways, introducing various changes to the design. The eventual rifle combined a heavy wooden stock, slow rate of fire, and poor accuracy at long ranges. Circle G attempted various different variants, finding the most success with a short stock automatic carbine for close quarter combat, and a sniper version rechambered for 308 caliber ammunition. The army rejected the design. After company executives bribed several congressmen, the DoD was forced to give Circle G a production contract of 100,000 rifles. Most of which ended up in National Guard or Reserve Unit warehouses. 200 years later, the combat rifle and the assault rifle were the best options that the Minutemen had for equipping a large force of soldiers. Dancer would have preferred to acquire large numbers of the R91 assault rifle. He knew that the Brotherhood held many of these weapons in storage. However, with the gunner war looming on the horizon, they would have to work with what they could get. Hancock managed to make deals with smugglers and traders to acquire their stocks of these weapons. By mid-April, the weapons began to arrive and be distributed to the Minutemen. Now the Minutemen needed to look like soldiers. Captain Dancer told Garvey that the Minutemen needed uniforms. If they look like soldiers, then they will act like soldiers. As they were a militia, the Minutemen did not traditionally wear uniforms except for their trademark Stetson hats. John Hancock approached Becky Fallon in Diamond City about designing a functional and distinctive uniform for the Minutemen. With the help of Anne Hargraves, she came up with a blue fatigue uniform that would use flame retardant materials as well as incorporating ballistic weave. Only some of the new fatigues would be ready in time for the gunner war. In the meantime, she took existing clothes and dyed them blue to give the Minutemen something like a uniform. Armor protection was even more difficult to acquire. Pre-war combat armor was ideal but hard to come by. These were at first reserved only for officers and scouts. In the meantime, leather and metal armor was issued to the troops. All the armor pieces were dyed blue. In time, 
the Minutemen would gather and repair enough combat armor to supply all the army. One iconic piece of equipment was not replaced. The Stetson hat was as emblematic to the Minutemen as power armor was to the Brotherhood. Becky Fallon designed a metallic inner liner to wear under the Stetson to provide some protection. Eventually Ballistic Weave would also be incorporated into the hat to turn it into a functional piece of armor as well as a stylish one. Power armor was incorporated into the Minutemen ranks. The sole survivor donated his collection of power armors that he had come across in his travels. This became the nucleus of the Minuteman Power Armor Company. As power armor was complicated to repair and even harder to replace, the Minutemen used these as sparingly as possible in the first few years. In addition to the regular armor, a variety of specialist uniforms were created for the support personnel that kept the Minutemen fighting in the field. Uniform variants also would appear as the Commonwealth expanded to places like Far Harbor and Nuka World. But the infantry units did not fight alone. The one area where the Minutemen held a definite advantage was in fire support. The 12-inch coastal defense mortars at the castle ensured that the Minutemen had overwhelming fire support for any battle that they were in range of. However, the antiquated artillery pieces were not very mobile. Clarence Codman of Codman Farms had to provide several of his Brahmin to pull the artillery pieces around the Commonwealth during the Gunner and Raider Wars. The last shining moment for the old mortars was when they were moved up Mount Cadillac to provide crucial fire support during the Battle of Southern Far Harbor. After that, the Minutemen began to develop artillery pieces more like the mobile howitzers that the gunners used. Vertibirds came into use after the Gunner War. Using various wrecked vertibirds found around the Commonwealth, and with a lot of technical assistance from the Brotherhood, the Minutemen got four vertibirds up and running. This limited air support was put to good use in the Far Harbor intervention when the first Minuteman company was quickly deployed to the island. Medical care was a priority. One of the sole survivor's companions, Curie, organized the medical detachment. The doctors and nurses of the Minutemen closely followed the troops into battle and sometimes became casualties themselves. For the Raider War of 2289, the Medical Corps was given less distinctive outfits to wear on the battlefield. Over time more support units like logistics, engineering, and communications would be added as the Minutemen matured into a professional fighting force. Just after the Institute War the Minutemen had 60 members. They had all fought the Institute and many had combat experience from their previous time in the Minutemen. Dancer took a dozen of the most experienced troopers and sent them to silently stalk gunner patrols and to scout out the gunner positions around the Commonwealth. This information would be critical in the first few days of the gunner war. These Minutemen would later become the nucleus of the elite Minuteman scouts. The rest of the Minutemen were divided up to form the core of the first six Minutemen companies. These veterans would help integrate all the new recruits into the new Minutemen. The Minuteman command structure divided among squads, platoons, and companies. The basic Minuteman combat squad consisted of four Minutemen carrying combat rifles, three carrying lasers, one carrying an assault rifle or a missile launcher, and one sniper carrying a hunting rifle or laser musket. Squads made up the core of the Minutemen. Squads could be used in a variety of roles from scouting enemy positions, to patrolling the frontiers, to fire support. A sergeant or corporal led a squad. Three squads made up a platoon. Platoons were the basic combat unit. Platoons were deployed to areas where the Minutemen expected a significant enemy presence. A lieutenant or senior sergeant led a platoon. Three platoons made up a company. Companies were the top tier. Companies were deployed to strike major targets such as gunner bases, raider clans, and mutant villages. They also comprised the core of Minuteman bases. A captain or senior lieutenant led a company. Six companies of Minutemen were ready just in time for the Gunner War. By the time that the Far Harbor intervention ended in 2293, the Minutemen would have 14 companies and support units. The general of the Minutemen was the senior most commander. The sole survivor held this title. He promoted Preston Garvey to colonel just before leaving. 
Garvey would functionally lead the Minutemen for the next three wars and five years. In time more colonels would be created. The post of general was reserved for the sole survivor in case he ever returned. Lieutenant Dancer was promoted to captain of the 3rd Minuteman Company just before hostilities with the gunners commenced. As September 1, 2288 arrived, the Minutemen were a completely different force than what they had been at the start of the year. The new model Minutemen were now better equipped, better organized, and better led than they had ever been in their entire history. The Gunner defeat of 2288 was the first of a long string of victories that first established and then expanded the boundaries of the Commonwealth. The people of the Commonwealth would reap the rewards of these victories. In the next episode of this series we will see what life was like for the average Commonwealth citizen. Did you clean up the DNA sample that we provided to you? The sample you gave me was very badly damaged. I was able to clone a mutant copy. For a human version I will need the research notes from Vault 108. We are getting a special forces unit to storm Vault 108 to get the research that you want. I must have all the research. With that information we will be able to clone an army of super mutants and over on the Commonwealth. Here is the first part of my end of the bargain. Whoever he was, he must have been very important for you to go to all this effort to recover his DNA. He was the greatest secret service agent that this country has ever had. What about the FEV gas spray? We need that to spray on the Brotherhood of Steel base in Washington. Were you able to acquire the FEV sample from Navarro? We lost several men going down there, but we retrieved the sample you wanted. With this sample I will be able to make a sprayable version of the virus. The Brotherhood and the Commonwealth will pay for what they did to the Institute. 